give it a couple minutes. We usually yeah, we can give it a couple minutes. Maybe a minute or two. Maybe you could talk about some of the topics today, Brent. No, we're not gonna be talking about Venezuelan milk. You can't just, just you can't just pick two letter two words because they're at the beginning of the sentence, Brent, and assume that they sum up the title. So just to be clear, we are not talking about Venezuelan milk. We are gonna be talking about the Venezuelan Brent, milk. Brent, I think you should use Venezuelan milk in the sizzler. I'm totally cool with it. <laughs> All right, I've been outvoted, sadly. That's how democracy works. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Continue with your sizzler. Oh, Brent. Brent, Uncle Benny Boy wants to know, what is this voice chat for? Why are we here, Brent? Think of it as this week in our cryptocurrency. <laughs> uh, uh, Brent does have grandiose issues, and that's all right. We fit into them. So, Master Brent, please continue with your sizzle. <laughs> <laughs> or just make it one long discussion about him at the end rather than two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Brent, fuck JP Morgan. What did they do? Oh boy.
So Brent, um, all right, let's just say for the sake of argument that we're going to take the core position of this article and take it to be true, right? There's a lot of people that seem to agree, okay, you know, we've gone X amount of time without a recession, just this recession to the mean and things like that. We should expect an economic downturn in the near future. And every year that goes by, it becomes more likely. Let's say we just accept that premise without focusing too much on JP Morgan. I want to go back to the point you were making about the relationship between a recession and cryptocurrency, because I agree with you, number one, that we don't know necessarily that a recession is going to be good for cryptocurrency. But I do think that it'll be a very interesting be, uh, situation because it'll be the first recession that cryptocurrency will play a role in. So it'll be our first ability to see where are people going to go? How do institutions respond? How aggressively do governments respond? Where does the capital flow as the economy, economy recovers? Where does the capital flow from countries that lose the most faith in their currency? And we could start putting a lot of the stuff that up until this point has just been hypothesis. We're actually going to start putting some of that to the test. And I think that yeah, I don't want to say that's exciting or uh, obviously a recession is not exciting, but it's also interesting, you know? Oh, we've definitely discussed a few times about how the recession could actually be the the point that gets crypto the attention that it was looking for. We did a crypto convos uh, with a friend of ours, Pete, who was a financial advisor for a long time. He worked for a large company, Merrill Lynch and one other one. That wasn't JP Morgan. I forget which off the top of my head, but he actually showed us one of these internal notes and it was very unique. It was very interesting. Um, it was about 40 pages long. It was internal research that they paid for uh, about Bitcoin. And it was, it was a very like at the time, I'm thinking this was probably about a year ago. This was probably fall of last year, if I recall correctly. And that that it was very like not public. And I think it was even mentioned in there that like, this isn't supposed to be released to the public. This is internal documents. All right, so here's what the main counter that I would have to this comment is uh, it's going to be hard to, first of all, let me preface this by saying the answer to almost everything that we say is going to happen is yes, some people will sell their crypto because they need money. Uh, some people will buy crypto because it is cheaper. There's going to be all kinds of people in all kinds of situations that are going to be doing a lot of things. But the question is, which groups are most dominant, which groups are going to move around the most capital, right? I would say that a lot of the money in crypto comes from upper middle class, uh, you know, first world people who in a recession might have their belt tightened a little bit, but they're not necessarily going to need uh, the money to survive. We also, I think another interesting thing is people who have a lot of discretionary income that is currently in another uh, denomination like dollar or euro, the question is, as the recovery comes in, did those governments take action which reduces the faith in the currency? And then do a lot of people start throwing that money into crypto? It's just, there's just so many variables that I feel like it's very difficult, aka impossible to predict the actual movement. That's why you needed to play out to actually get some valuable data. One of the questions that I had in this conversation is how internationally congruent would a recession be? 
Is this just a U.S. discussion? What right, about good cream? No, so okay, I want to ask the real world. So I agree that this is <clears throat> this is a possibility, but I feel like we all know that the currency that would have to face a severe situation is the dollar. Like the dollar is the reserve asset right now. A lot of most money that is trying to get out of any kind of fiat is going into the US dollar. So the real question, I think, is does something happen with the U.S. dollar that triggers a flee? And then I could see a capital flow that says, um, oh, maybe we don't go to another fiat. Maybe we go to something that isn't fiat. But all of these, all of these crises, people who have rupees, people who have yen, people who have pounds all over the world, the reserve asset ultimately is the U.S. dollar. So that's what we're really talking about here, I think. So... Let's. I'm gonna try to introduce something that um, that I've learned as I've gotten into crypto that I think is very applicable here. When you know, I started kind of getting into the markets, trading a little bit. You know, whether that was fiat converting to Bitcoin, converting to alts, or just you know other high level tra- or high market cap transactions. My question is, when you see, we're seeing a arguable recession in say bitcoin and ethereum compared to the us dollar but compared to each other it's a completely different concept it's a completely different chart there's a completely different comparison if you compare bitcoin to ethereum for example in their trading pairs my question is if all of the dollars are kind of losing face simultaneously and let's pretend the us dollar is at the same flood height with them and they're all draining they still trade the same between each other. So where does the faith lose? I'll tell you what, uh, just to keep the mood going and kind of staying on topic, the next, (laughs) that's Venezuelan milk. Well, listen, in all seriousness, though, this topic does relate because we're talking about a recession and how a recession is not good and it's not something to look forward to. And I think that this is a great reminder of that because the people in Venezuela, as we know right now, are going through legitimate economic hardships from a country that had a pretty decent standard of living not that long ago, right? So there's this character, I think his uh, screen name is I'm Vito. I'm actually going to go ahead and post the link as well. Um, but he's had a couple of posts where he tracks cryptocurrency spreading in Venezuela. And I guess he had a positive response and people started sending him money and he was trying to figure out what to do with the money that was donated and ended up deciding because situation in Venezuela is so bad that people are actually in need of food. Like one of the big problems they've had is like average weight loss has gone way up, actual starvation. Um, So this kid and his family um, made a bunch of arepas and went around filmed like as they went through the streets of Venezuela, giving it to like people who are telling him, oh, my God, thank you so much. Can I have another one? I haven't had a lot to eat. They're like really showing so much appreciation. He goes to a hospital and you just see like really that just came from the cryptocurrency community 
uh, his connection to forums like this, uh, this community, people like pitching in and helping people at the other side of the world. It was really cool to see. He's had a couple of posts. You could go look at his history. Um, you know, and obviously at the top comment from you was just his reference. I'll put it in here, but it was really sweet, you know, cause he's, he's a young kid. I mean, from the, from the pictures, I think he looks like he's 16, 17. Um, oh yeah, there you go. Thank you, Brent. <laughs> but he says, this was something surreal for me after giving away the arepas. I cried with my mom a little bit. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them. So yeah, recessions and depressions and economic hardships are not something to look forward to, but it's awesome that this space can be a tool to alleviate some of that suffering and possibly prevent it by creating uh, more resistant and democratic economic systems. Great. <laughs> yeah no honestly no, but it's uplifting it, you should be this part of the story is a good story that he can do this the, the the depression of venezuela was happening regardless of this story Graham, I want to read between the lines a little bit in this. Um, I don't know why, but the fact that a a South American teenager is is admitting in a public forum that he cried with his mom is like super interesting to me because I feel like we've discussed in the past that I feel like that's culturally like not encouraged very much. And, you know, I I'm just really excited that, you know, there are more people that are becoming products of the the internet and not you know their exact birthplace and whatnot uh yeah i think i don't think that there's that much of uh negative cliche not in colombian and venezuelan culture at least uh in regards to something like that you know i think this is it's that kind of crying because of like you're overwhelmed with positive emotions or or emotions of gratitude or like or like understanding some you know um, yeah, but I agree with you that it's good to be a product of a culture that allows you to express this positively and then encourages him to, it's okay to be overwhelmed because you're doing something positive, you know, or because the magnitude of the situation is striking. Like it is crazy pitch guys. If you ever want to do some work like this, let's, let's talk about it long-term <laughs> deal.
<laughs> okay, <laughs> this sounds cutting edge. <laughs> How much has he tried to raise? By the way. <laughs> Um, so I don't slight, know. Slight ahead, comment Mike. real quick about the sources. I just want to add uh, the pictures have sources on them, but it's basically saying they just got their sources from ICOs. Like it's kind of they go out of their way to point that they just like did what the most obvious thing is. It's self-reported, yeah. But uh, side note, this you know how he's using all the big words, all the like fancy words. Um, this is called techno babble and it's like a lot of fun it's kind of like when somebody speaks in uh legalese or something you know when you're saying like a bunch of oh you know because of like the quantum consciousness interconnected da, 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 <laughs> and it's all just it just it's like a barrage of nonsense but it just sounds overwhelming and it's like the number one technique for people like you know deepak chopra and shit you know that like <laughs> they just overwhelm you <laughs> Uh, flux capacitor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I feel like that's more forgivable on a sci-fi TV show. <laughs> <laughs> like, I get it. I, I don't expect you guys to go figure out quantum physics in order to write the next episode. Right. How is how can any of them have made money recently? Like, yeah. Well, and hold on a second too. I also want to point out that that should never be a standard that we apply because even if for the rest of history, eighty percent of ICOs fail, uh, that's fine. Tons of businesses fail. As a matter of fact, part of the entrepreneurial risk is that you are very likely to fail, and that doesn't mean that it's not productive. Right. The the what matters is to make sure that people aren't being deceived and that their risk is risk to fraud as opposed to risk to unsuccessful uh, business ideas or business applications. I know we've mentioned this a couple times, but if you twist that around, if 20% of ICOs are going to be like reasonably cool, that's a higher number than I expected. Right, right, right. Exactly. I was pulling a number out of my butt to be fair. Like, I don't, you know, <laughs> well, I no, you were, you were created that number somewhat around the ideas that are mentioned in the, in the story we're talking about. Right, right. Guys, yeah, most businesses fail. Don't All right, them. Brent. Speaking of an ICO on Ethereum, you're up. Let's talk. We're talking about Substratum. Oh. <laughs> What kind of crazy? <laughs> oh my god mm -hmm. 
Wow. Okay, so so just to be clear, I want to make sure I'm understanding this though, Brent. He was like reverse being subtle, like he was like satirically posting it, being like, "Oh, hashtag humble," which that's is amazing. hilarious. If somebody, did. oh my god, that's so many layers. I love it. Wow. They, dude, I bet I bet they just have you like send in any picture of you holding any magazine and they just Photoshop the cover. <laughs> oh, <What's> it? <laughs> I thought I thought it was a it was like a somebody took a picture of him holding the magazine and he's like like I thought no, that no, was no, pretty no. not even that Mike not even that? that like just oh a, just God. an image that looks like okay a magazine like cover. I know there's been a lot of like rumblings about how bad Substratum's been I I think even Doug Polk covered it but I never got around to watching it I'm curious what uh, I'm curious how much more there is to this story. Sarcasm. <laughs> Before you go on, man, Polk County is not a place you want to be known from. It's it's kind of like it's kind of like the white trash meth capital, of Florida. Jeez. Like legit. So go on. I'm interested to see where this is going. All right, I think I'm going to have the only, like, devil's advocate response here. I'm just going to say it real quick so we can move on. But, like, I guess the best thing is that, like, it, it's been 16 years since anything's happened. Like, I don't know. I, I got to leave the sliver open that he's kind of, like, not this person anymore. But, uh, obviously, these are massive red flags. Uh, these cannot be ignored, um, you know. Brent, get to the funny comment. It's so funny. I love it. Can you? It. I actually don't get it. I'm I, I'm sorry. I don't get it. Well, you don't get it. Oh man, because Chad's like. <laughs> what? I've never heard that before. Like a like a bully or like a, it's just like a stereotypically bully. All right, yeah. I mean, I I get it. I've just never heard that once. Yeah. Hmm. All right.
Definitely. And just just a reminder to all the uh, listeners, the Crypto Basic Podcast doesn't engage in name classification. We're just kidding. Funny coincidences. We don't care if your name's Chad or Justin. You must be swell guy. <laughs> so politically correct. Just letting them all know. <laughs> we took care of that problem last year. <laughs> I think Garitana is coming in with the confirmation that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I guess that's uh, a yes. Yeah, it's a trolley yes. <laughs> it's like a bring it yes. <laughs> I love it. All right. Let's talk about Ethereum, boys. Yeah, I thought this was a little bit interesting and I don't have the link. So I'm going to go find it real quick. I put it in this. I know where I put it. All right. Copy. All righty. Thanks for that plug, Brent. So we are talking about Ethereum and we are talking about GitHub. And I thought this was particularly interesting because it was a measurement of how quickly certain open source projects on GitHub were growing. Uh, currently, Ethereum is number five and the list included uh, 10 names that I only recognized one of them. However, I'm assuming uh, people that are more familiar with GitHub will be, you know, a little more familiar with some of these. So number one, the fastest growing open source project on GitHub was Microsoft Docs. So, um, and I'm, they, they hyphenated. Uh, okay. I, yeah, see, I'm not familiar with any of this stuff. Um, behind the scenes on GitHub. So basically, for those that are unfamiliar with GitHub, to my knowledge, the understanding of what it is, is it is the place where developers commit to working on projects so that there's some sort of understanding, um, gl like globally outside of that, that there is progress being worked on in that. Is that basically what you guys understand? Right. And that collaborative Yeah, it's GitHub is like a mix between LinkedIn, Trello, and like Reddit for developers. I feel like, or like we're not maybe not Reddit as much, but you're just it's they're collaborating, they're sharing open source, they're you know built like Brent said, building a resume. Right. There you go. So Ethereum is currently number five and they're experiencing a, a two X change. Um, I tried to briefly look around and see what time frame that this was listed over, but this was just a screenshot. So uh, I didn't, I didn't actually d dive in fully, but um, some of the other projects, PyTorch, uh, Go.Engine, Nuxt, I, you know, these are things that I'm not familiar with, but yeah, this, you, it's really nice to see Ethereum uh, separating itself. You know, we mentioned that earlier, you know, how interesting that is with them. And one of the things we've talked about, Mike, which I think that this story is a really good indicator of is, um, you know, a lot of people talk about a period of inactivity in crypto, or I've, I've at least heard that mentioned where people say, oh, well, there's nothing really going on. And it's really ironic that people are saying that because I'm seeing more mainnets being launched and actual like development or, you know, features coming out or projects going into new stages. What they really mean is there's been uh, a non-interesting price activity. 
a price activity that it, that we don't like, so it's boring and it's not as interesting. But really, all kinds of things are happening, like all kinds of developments and mainnets and everything. The space is still evolving rapidly. Well, and people, I've, I've said this before. Uh, so for those of you that get us more on our cryptocurrency and not our podcast, I'm kind of a big believer in the major projects. You know, I, the first mover advantages, the projects that are already have a huge market cap and already have so much work. And I feel like people underestimate, like when it comes to Bitcoin, as if it's just people's opinion of Bitcoin that makes it so powerful. And they completely take for granted how many you know, nodes are already running that network, how much, how many side projects and side chains and interacting networks are built on that blockchain. And the same thing goes with Ethereum. You know, all of these projects, like so few of them have to come through for Ethereum to become indispensable that, you know, it, just when you see something like, oh, the Ethereum killer, like, well, okay, I'm not saying something can't compete with Ethereum, but you know, look at the fundamentals, look at the underlying networks. How big are they? How strong are they? That's going to be a big indicator of their resilience. <clears throat> so uh, real yes, quick here, I'm, I'm posting my my screenshot from the from the outline under the chat. Uh, I saw somebody else struggle with that earlier. I, I figured out how I did it, but I'm curious how you guys copied this over. I ended up taking a clip art of my outline and just copying it over, <laughs> which I thought was interesting inception. I was cutting the cut. Yeah. yeah. Anywho, these, yeah. This yeah. Well, no, we you, all grew up in the internet. The we, we got, okay. So they don't know that. So Mike is actually from 1774 and we brought him here on a time machine. So <laughs> when it comes to anything that's like email or, or an app or software, it's, it gets complicated. <laughs> Uh, no, no. I, my point is I used the snipping tool to put the picture on the outline, but then I couldn't get it from the outline to the discord. So, you just so I had to one. do, I did a snipping tool again from the outline <laughs> to there. That, that was, works. Right. That, that was the joke I was trying to make the first time and failed miserably. So my favorite comments <laughs> on this story, um, uh, the fudsters can't counter this one. Keep building. And then people were like, do they actually FUD Ether? And then the comment was, people think EOS is an Ethereum killer. And I said, uh, that, that was good stuff. Uh, some people thought it was at some point. <laughs> but listen, to be fair, how could <clears throat> Ethereum be better than EOS when EOS had like five times as many ICOs? That's a lot more starting money, guys. <laughs> That's a big hit to start. No, it was 11 more ICOs. Oh, I'm sorry. 11 more ICOs. Right. So, That's a lot more popular. Right off the bat, if you could have 11 ICOs, you know you're good. They had to have one ICO <laughs> per validator. Uh, sorry, sorry. We shouldn't come in here and just bash random projects. Let's just move on. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right. So hopefully this isn't going to fail. We're going to move on to a little story I found where uh, Mike Novogratz, his crypto fund is Fidelity's first custodial client. And, you know, this is something that, you know, <laughs> we go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Mike Novogratz, 
He owns Galaxy Digital, which is a crypto merchant bank. Um, and this was something that I learned recently. I think we talked about this on the flagship, but you know, Fidelity is the fourth largest asset management company in the entire world. And their total assets in management is about $7.2 trillion. So, you know, that is quite a lot of moving power. And they launched a subsidiary company called Fidelity Digital Assets. And that's going to do all the custodial solutions for the institutional investors and the accredited investors that are customers with Fidelity. So who has access to this merchant banking um, custodial action? Basically, all 27 million Fidelity customers and the 23,000 businesses that are aligned with Fidelity are going to be given the infrastructure and the services for the crypto market. So I thought that was extremely interesting. And that's a lot of people that are going to have a lot of access now. And one of the things that the article mentioned, and I'm curious how you guys respond to this, but it, you know, they were discussing like who it was designed to help. And, you know, it said this was designed to help hedge funds, which I thought was fairly obvious. But then they mentioned pensions and they also mentioned academic institutions. So way more the academic institutions, but even the pensions ones to a slight degree. Um, like, why does the article take that twist or why? It's, it's not a twist. Are? It's not a twist. They're, they're saying oh, then can explain it, please. Yeah, it's it's the same category because they're handled in different um, in a different way because it's a large pool of money that has to be invested. So with the hedge fund, it's a group of investors that are privately going to somebody and saying, hey, you go manage this. But with the pensions, let's say, for example, you've had a police or a teachers union paying into a pension for all these years, all of that money's held in one place, invested and expected to be paid out when that teacher's ready to retire. And the same thing with academic institutions, you look at something like Yale or Harvard, they're gonna have pools of money from all of their donations and profits and things like that, that is then used for whatever they need to use in the school, but they need to have it somewhere. So what they're talking about here is large pools of investment. Yeah. Yeah. And just real quick, guys, I think we should give it a tiny little bit more credit in the sense that, you know, this could be interesting because let's say that somebody is running a pension fund or somebody is running a fund with an academic institution, if they were interested in investing in cryptocurrency because of how bureaucratic a pool of money like that is, it's kind of a tough pill to sell to be like, to go to the board and say, hey, listen, I think we should invest in Bitcoin. So I'm just gonna like make a, you know, $500,000 withdrawal, put it into this Ledger Nano that I'll keep in this little safety deposit box, you know, as opposed to being able to say, okay, you know, Fidelity is handling a portion of it, we can, We'll tell them that this portion we want in Bitcoin and there's a, a more guaranteed, bureaucratic, paperwork-filled, insured uh, transaction of the money. So it could actually be a really useful tool for, for more money to come into the space. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I, I, I just had my saying. first dog barking situation, so I, I was BRB. I apologize. Nobody asked for your life story, guys. Continue. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. No, no, that's just that's the link for the. I already sent that link. No, but I'm saying like I I added the the detail underneath this that Novogratz is semi famous in the crypto community for for referencing you know open quote the herd is coming end quote referring to mainstream adoption. So I guess that's in one of the videos that you know he's most popular for. That's something he was like hammering home that the herd is coming. The herd is coming. <laughs> Uh, indeed. So <clears throat> we are kind of starting to wrap up here. And what we'd like to do in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the show is open it up for comments or questions. We've always given the opportunity for anybody that wants to hop on voice to share their opinion, but people tend to be shy around the mics, but any questions or stories you want to share? <laughs> was that when i sent it to you yes okay so i sold my nano to brent over the counter <laughs> i love this <laughs> Well, yeah, Bob's story is a little different. <clears throat> it was like September of 2017. Brent bought it at the at the current time. The all time high was 35, and it went down to like 23 for several. I mean, it felt like a long time, you know, in our crypto space. So that was, that was a joke. I was able to hold over him for a while. <clears throat> you know what, actually? I'm when... officially below my second entry point. I had two entry points into Neo, one at six and one at 20. And I thought the one at 20 was a real good move. And here we are at 16. Shows how smart anybody is, <laughs> you know? All right. Well, what what I learned was that we probably have more time than I originally suspected, and yeah, that's just is, fine by me. But that's the thing too. It's about your event horizon, you know. Because seriously, if you if you buy this and you say to yourself, "Wow, this is going to be worth so much money in five years," uh, you know, we the three of us have been or are professional poker players, and you have to respect variance. Like if you think something can go up. 10 or 20 times in value in a five-year period, that means that it can easily fluctuate 80%, 70% of its current value in a one-year period, you know, because it's something that's inherently volatile. So we shouldn't really be surprised and we shouldn't be surprised if it goes a lot lower and we shouldn't be surprised if it bounces back up only to go back down again. <clears throat> <laughs> wow, that was very convincing. <laughs> Yeah, I can't promise that these coins will retain the value you paid for, but you bought them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, they that they mean something to good. you. <laughs> That's ah, oh, dumb Rick. I love it. that was a great scene and a great explanation. I actually couldn't remember which Rick that was. I don't doofus Rick, doofus Rick. doofus Rick, baby. Yeah, we're talking about Rick and Morty. In case you don't know, mm. if you don't know, you should now you know. know. Go watch it, Ninja. No, oh but I'm dying God. to hear. Yes, please. 
Oh, please. I'm opening it right now. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, oh man i wish it was like a trail you got to pick a path each time and the questions different but they all on... lead the same way <laughs> yes that'd be amazing <laughs> for block of chain i love that <laughs> <laughs> oh no, pop up. <clears throat> Amen, brother. <laughs> well, hold on, real quick, real quick. To be fair, banks also exploit the rich. I, I just want to be clear about that. Not Hold as on, bad, Brent. but they exploit everybody. <laughs> Brent, let's do question and answer. I'm going to read, and you can answer the last couple, all right? Is there really child pornography encoded into Bitcoin's blockchain? <laughs> <laughs> Would Reisman use further entrench us in our dependence on technology without which we would be plunged into a horrifying new dark age? <laughs> okay, but this last one's dumb. Uh, you just, listen, listen. You just reminded me of an argument that I had with a family friend. We were sitting over, this was for, I think we were getting together for my sister's birthday or Mother's Day or something like that. Whatever. So somebody was saying how, oh, now this young generation doesn't know how to make their way around and that if GPS systems crashed, that what would they do? <laughs> and I'm just like, uh, do you understand what would happen if GPS systems crashed? Are you worried about your son not being able to make it to the grocery store? Do you know what would happen to the society you live in, like your work? Like, you know, and it's so annoying that people think whatever skills they had to grow up with, those are the skills that matter. So they don't think, oh, wow, I don't know how to sew my own clothes anymore. But so what are you going to do if, if, if all the clothes companies collapse? Are you going to, you can't make, you can't grow your own food. You can't do any stuff. So what, you're going to become a farmer now? So that in case the world ends, you could grow your own food. I think there's more productive ways to live in the real, in the current world. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, apparently we're. Yeah. <laughs> what was that weird knock on gas station employees? What? That was so like. <laughs> what? Because people, because people drive through there. There's travelers. Like that's like a place of commute. Like, or, like I don't understand. And that is a life pro tip by none other than the crypto chef. If you ever find yourself lost and GPS has exploded, go to your nearest deliverer of, yeah. <laughs> find an Uber driver, <laughs> flag him down to pull over <laughs> and ask him for a driver. <laughs> Literally go on the internet and summon a stranger car to you. Confirmed. Except for vapors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the signal's usually 
I'm cooler than you. <laughs> Whatever it is. That was crafty. Uh, all right. Join us next week. You okay there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Um, that is... Uh, uh, well, they were American. Is that a threat? <laughs> they were American. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mike... <laughs> blowing smoke so Ponsar's clearly an expert on smoke signals so we're going to have to take him seriously here as we could tell from his avatar <laughs> uh, no but seriously this was a good time uh, we're going to be here also next week same time different topics uh, except for McAfee I'm same sorry. subreddit <laughs> same subreddit If you're interested in more of our content, we are the Crypto Basic Podcast. You can follow us at CryptoBasicPodcast.com and check out our episodes archive. Peace.